So now uh, let's take a look at Flip. And I will start with this quote from Hermann Hauser. He's the CEO from Acorn, and he was in charge of managing people who made the first uh, version of uh, the ARM chip, which are powering our iPhone or iPad. And he said this sentence, I took two crucial decisions about making this processor. I gave them no people, I gave them no money. There was no way for them to come up with a complex chip. And with Flip, when I look back, uh, we had a very small staff, very, very small. And at the same time, Home Studio, as you can imagine, was a really big project. And we really need to be simple. And from my point of view, in my opinion, when I look back, I think it was really a crucial decision. So first, we had to look into that. Um, all the solutions like CRD, the operations transformation, are made to be peer-to-peer, -peer, OK? But we all know here that distributed systems are harder to design than, for example, central systems, OK? And we had um, a competitor called Rocket Network. And Rocket Network made kind of a very um, simple, real-time, collaborative uh, system, so it was not as good as solutions that exist now. But their problem, they just failed and they just shut down. Why? It was not so much about collaboration. It's just because they wanted like, to make this peer-to-peer -peer network. They had uh, to um, make sure that people would actually configure their router for them like, to accept actually uh, packets, like um, getting in their network. So they had to configure their routers. And maybe it's OK when you've got like, ITs uh, in a company, but for uh, people working alone, it's going to be a very complicated task. And just for that, actually, they failed. And if you want to know about like, a practical, realistic implementation of peer-to-peer, -peer, you need to look on the sky part with the super nodes. I don't know if some of you here know how it's done. It's using super nodes, which were not part of the infrastructure back in the days. And it's really quite complicated just to have a working solution of peer-to-peer. -peer. So we, uh, yeah. And also, um, you need to consider that you need to store documents somewhere because most probably you will make some work, you will collaborate with someone which is probably not in the same time zone. And you want to make sure that everyone is working on the last version of the document. So you probably want to store them centrally. And even if you look at um, um, Google Docs, uh, Google Docs has a central server to store the documents. So we came to the conclusion that peer-to-peer -peer is quite actually expensive for probably not so much benefits. And we gained something very important, is that instead of having a partial ordering on events, like di distributed systems, we have a total order of events. So it's changed mathematically everything to something much more simpler. So for flip operation, what we discovered very quickly is that we want user intention to be more explicit. Then we want something conflict-free, but almost conflict-free. And here the important word is almost, as compared for CRDD, who, was, who, who is going to always make something conflict-free. And we had this intuition that maybe actually conflicting when user intentions conflict is totally OK. So to uh, illustrate that, we are going to get into a world of developers. We manipulate data models. We usually handle data models with values and containers. And then let's take an example. Let's have an intuition about values. So let's say that we've got a star, and user 1 wants to put it at some position, while user 2 want it like to put it at some other position. Okay? Maybe it's totally fine to say that user 1 is going to fail to do it, or maybe user 2. Maybe. And to continue on this intuition on how to do things, let's consider data models. So usually, we, have, we start with user actions. And a way to represent user action can be done through transactions. Okay? We, we are going to say like a user action is a transaction. Okay? And this transaction is going to be made of atoms, and those atoms are going to be the tiniest parts that can actually modify a document over time. Okay? And we've seen like from the very beginning that we want all this to be log-free. Okay? So if I show you atoms and log-free, does someone has an intuition about how we can do things? Yes? No? Oh. <laughs> Atomic instructions. 
The idea is to use the same concept of for compare and swap that you've got in Intel processors. So we are going to design operation with this concept. So one way to represent that, so I'm giving you here like a very simple way, like for values, is to say that for operation which is going to transition from A to B, uh, to remind you like compare and swap is this idea of uh, if it's the same as what I expect, then I will change it to another value. So here it's like to transition from A to B, what we are going to say is that we have a fun fun uh, constant function which always return B, and what is probably non-standard is we are going to define it on a very small domain which is going to be the single element of A. Meaning that this function, as you can only like have an input which is exactly A. Okay, so this is exactly or one way actually like to represent compare and swap. Okay, so here's an important uh, thing from the mathematical world to the programming world is that the execution is a domain. This is the idea behind it. So let's have a look at it. So let's say that the star we've seen before is at position zero. And the first user wants to move it from 0 to minus 1. And then the second user wants to move it from 0 to 2. Okay? And because we have a total order of event, because we are on a central server, the operations are actually uh, going to be executed in a specific order. So let's say that the second user actually gets its operation executed first. In this case, it's going to be able actually to apply this function because it's on actually on the right domain. It starts from 0. The position of the star was zero, so we can execute or apply the function. And then the star is going to position two. But when the second operation is going to come, we see we can't apply this function because the star position is at two and the operation domain is just like this single element zero. Okay? So this is the idea behind it. So let's now take, uh, we've got like numbers of containers uh, in Flip. Let's take a very simple one. Let's say a vector or a list, an ordered container. And so here I have a represented, like typically a vector, starting at index zero, having three elements. And on the left and right side, I'm putting the, those virtual elements we use uh, in our developer world to represent the first element, bef uh, yeah, the virtual element before the first element, and then the virtual element after the last element, to allow, for example, like to push back or these kind of things. So. I'm showing you this, and this is the way actually, for example, operational transformation uh, represents uh, a piece of text. But if I show you this, for example, do you have an idea, do you have an intuition on how actually we can do something about collaboration and inserting things? Anyone has an idea? No one? Very shy, okay. <laughs> we can just divide actually uh, as many times as we want. Uh, the, the space between 0 and 1. We are considering floating point numbers, so not necessarily floating point numbers like we have in processor, who are limited to 32 or let's say 64 bits, but more generally floating, num uh, floating point numbers with no limitation of bits, so we can always actually divide and put an element between uh, the other two. It's really important. And when we think, it's, yeah, the solution actually is quite naive, right? But we are thinking also like, yeah, but we have only one character and one floating point number, which can be very big, just to encode like the position. So maybe it's kind of a waste of, of uh, space, right? Uh, it is, but when you think about it, actually for an average book chapter, okay, like any kind of book, the size of those keys, like the floating point numbers, is going to represent 25 uh, megabytes, okay? When Google Chrome is probably like taking uh, half a gigabyte uh, in the background. So maybe 25 megabytes is a waste some more of space, but on today's computer, it's probably good enough, a good enough solution. So. So here we can also see that if two people, let's say like uh, 0.25 is not here, two people are trying to insert an element between 0 and 0 0.5, uh, it's going to conflict, right? So we can think about like, oh, can we make it here so that we can have less conflict? So some, does someone have an idea? No? Yes? No? Okay, so we can do it through randomness. This is another idea. So just to make sure that they are not going to collide, we are going to put some random bits. And in this case, actually, we have this very important uh, property. So mathematically speaking, it's not conflict-free because you can 
get the same random numbers going to conflict. But most of the time, you can design your random algorithm and the number of uh, random bits to make it so that a conflict is going to be very rare. So it's not strictly never happening, but it's going to be really, really rare, okay? So this is a way actually to handle uh, conflicts uh, in an ordered container. Um, and this solution, actually, uh, it's one which is uh, used in Home Studio. It's really nice, like for small containers. So when you've got like a container of 1,000 or 10,000 elements, this is a very, very good solution, like for small containers. So if we need to remember something, is that this, this float index, they provide more context implicitly because it's a position somehow, you know? It's even if the two uh, neighboring elements are disappearing, we still know actually where we are. So it's very, very powerful. And also an idea, a very, very strong idea is that this float index is a unique identifier. You can refer it like some kind of address or something like that. It's a unique identifier of the underlying elements. This is very, very strong. And finally, those algorithms are lock-free. It's because the idea of making a floating index is the same as allocating, and we can, with randomness, actually make a lock-free allocator. So it's really, really strong. So let's take a look at transactions. So we've seen like one, um, one uh, atomic operation, and here the idea is like just to make transaction, we are going to compose actually those functions. So actually, you can't always write uh, actually this expression, because if the domain are not matching, actually this function is ill-formed, okay? But let's say uh, for the illustration that we can write this expression. Um, if we want to express the transaction inverse, it's going to be very simple. So first we are going to write actually the inverse of an operation. And for values that I've shown you before, actually it expressed very simply. The inverse uh, for a transition from A to B it's very intuitive, right? It's just going from B to A, okay? After that, you can prove it. But it's quite, the intuition is really strong on this one. And then to actually um, write a transaction inverse, you are just going to invert every operation and then compose them, but in the reverse order. It's simple as this. And so the idea after that is when we are applying actually the transaction, we don't calculate the function beforehand. This would be like uh, on the computing side, not necessarily efficient. So to do that, actually we are going to ex try to execute every operation. And when we have a domain problem, we are just going like to stop. And the very good thing is in this case where for example, operation three, could not actually be executed. The idea is that we can still express very, very easily, actually, the inverse of operations. So we can just roll back, actually, where we were and get back exactly to the same document set where we were before. So we call this uh, structural validation uh, in the flip world. And then there is another validation we call logical validation, and it expresses system invariance. And the idea is that usually when we make um, an application, we need a lot of flexibility on system invariance because specification always change. So how does it look like? Let's suppose that every operation actually uh, can be executed. In this case, we've got structural validation, okay? But still, because we have this operation and, um, and writing the inverse is like so easy, we can still actually uh, roll back the transaction very, very easily. So even when it's completely um, to the new document state, we can still roll back very easily. So what is very great uh, in FLIP is that operation design is completely decorrelated from system invariance. We've seen that in CRDD, actually, it's really strongly correlated. But in FLIP, it's completely decorated. So you build your operation design one and for all. Actually, it's already done. And then after that, you can write your system invariance freely. And the good thing is like control flow is totally handling it. You don't need to make some kind of magic because all this math behind are just making it really easy. And finally, if you think about it, inverting a transaction. We've seen that user action, we model it like a transaction. So actually undoing something is somehow roll back in this transaction. And we have a very simple way to express a transaction inverse. So here we have a very robust, elegant, and very, very easy uh, way to express undo and redo. So something like to remember, 
Conflicting when users conflict was really kind of a very interesting idea. Also, we have more context. This is really important. More context and no operation transformation. And finally, a very flexible system invariant engine.